Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Physiology Made Easy with me, Dr. Amir Sandhu. Now in today's episode we're going to be talking about the importance for exercise in the management of polycystic ovary syndrome, a very common condition around the world. So let's get straight into it. Okay, so polycystic ovary syndrome is an endocrine condition uh, which affects the metabolic, uh, which causes metabolic alterations in the body, uh, which impacts upon the reproductive health of the females. Now, in a polycystic ovary, we tend to get uh, lots of immature follicles. Uh, the enlargement of the ovaries can also be seen as well. Uh, and so you have these fluid-filled uh, follicles which are immature. Uh, and those underdeveloped follicles, they basically cannot be released for ovulation. And so the reproductive productive health uh, or, the, or the chance of actually having uh, a pregnancy reduces considerably. So in terms of how it happens, when, if we look at it in a, a, in a straightforward manner, it's changes that are happening in the brain which impact upon what's happening in the ovaries. Okay, So what's happening in the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland which is located in the hypothalamus is going to impact what's actually going to happen. Now if we if we've, we've zoomed in a little bit here, so what we can actually see here is that there is a hormone, hormone called the gonadotrophin releasing hormone. And that, the, the release of that hormone is cyclical or cyclical uh, and it impacts upon the release of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Now both of those hormones are involved at different phases of the menstrual cycle uh, to regulate what's actually going on in the ovaries. So let's kind of uh, go back to uh, the first phase. So you have the GnRH which is generally when it's released in uh, high amounts uh, you get an increase in luteinizing hormone and that's, known, that's generally happening in the follicular phase. When you have low amounts of gonadotrophin releasing hormone, uh, your follicle stimulating hormone increases and that's the luteal phase. So let's have a look then here. So in the follicular phase, we've got uh, an increased amount of uh, uh, gonadotrophin releasing hormone. That increases the release of luteinizing hormone. But what happens is there is a hormone called progesterone, which is abbreviated as P4 here, which is involved in uh, inhibiting GnRH activity. So when P4, progesterone, is released in the luteal phase, then what will happen is you start to get inhibition of GnRH activity, and we can see that the cyclical release of it is reduced in the uh, luteal phase, and essentially what that does is it allows the FA FSH to increase, uh, and that will allow the follicles to mature. Okay, so this is what's happening in a normal process. Now, for some reason, um, what will happen is if there are increased amounts of hormones or androgens, male hormones, uh, within the female, then that might impact the release of progesterone. And in, what will happen is progesterone will not be able to inhibit GnRH activity. And so we get uh, an increased release of GnRH or increased cyclical activity of GnRH, which then stops FSH from being released, but actually continues to increase luteinizing hormone. And that will prevent the follicles from maturing properly, and we actually get increased luteinizing hormone to follicle-stimulating hormone ratio. That ratio is increased if you go and have a, a blood test done. So the luteinizing hormone is actually increased, and that stops um, the um, follicular follicle, sorry, from developing correctly. So this is uh, the main thing that, that's happening. You you're getting this hormonal dysregulation. The key hormones involved are progesterone, uh, acting upon the gonadotrophin releasing hormone, which controls the activity of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And in PCOS, you're getting um, uh, reduced FSH, increased luteinizing hormone, and in ineffective development of the follicles. So that's the main kind of uh, cause of, of what's actually happening, um, or physiologically what's happening uh, at the connection between the brain and the ovaries. Now the main features and symptoms, so I've mentioned briefly there about the increase in male sex hormones. So there is hyperandrogenism uh, in most of the cases of polycystic ovary syndrome, and some of the symptoms that one might notice would be increased facial body hair, um, particularly around the chin, cheek area, uh, the periods become irregular and in some cases the period could be completely stopped altogether. Um, also there will be failure to ovulate or 
the ovulations will be very irregular and it's very difficult for females with polycystic ovary syndrome to get pregnant. It's not impossible, but it's a lot harder due to those hormonal disturbances affecting uh, the ovaries. Um, there is uh, a greater risk of having a weight gain as well. Uh, and long term as well, there is a, uh, a greater risk of infertility as well in about 40% of cases. Now, crucially, what happens in terms of the metabolic changes can be driven by changes to uh, what, how insulin is regulated and works within the body. So insulin resistance and type 2 di di diabetes is quite a hallmark of polycystic ovary syndrome. So females that have PCOS tend to, always, tend to also develop insulin resistance uh, and type 2 diabetes. They may also have increased visceral fat, which is the fat around our abdominal organs, uh, and they also develop uh, dislocation lipidemia which is basically elevated cholesterol uh, and a reduction of the good HDL cholesterol and these factors basically increase your risk of heart disease as well so PCOS is increasing heart disease risk by about 50% because you're having continued assault to the blood vessels of the body. Okay, now in terms of insulin resistance then and type 2 diabetes, so insulin resistance is quite important because insulin actually stimulates the ovaries to produce testosterone. Okay, now what happens with insulin is it inhibits another hormone which is called the sex hormone binding globulin or SHBG. And that also leads to increased testosterone. So you have two uh, effects of insulin. You have it stimulating the ovary to produce testosterone, which is the male sex hormone. And you have um, inhibition of SHBG, which also increases testosterone as well. Okay, so remember we talked in the uh, first slide or the physiology, ph physiology slide about um, hormonal disturbances impacting the release of um, uh, pituitary gland hormones, FSH, LA, LH, and GnRH as well. Well, some of it's going to be led by these hormonal changes occurring due to insulin res resistance. Now, insulin resistance also causes your carbohydrates that are taken in the diet to be processed in the liver instead of the muscle. Um, and you also get an increase in harmful cholesterol reduction in the good cholesterol. Uh, and also enzymes that are responsible for metabolizing the lipids are affected as well by insulin resistance. So really, in having insulin resistance and polycystic ovary syndrome uh, is a uh, they, they both kind of contribute to each other in making the metabolic health of the female worse so in terms of the treatment approaches um, because it's a multifactorial condition it presents with various phenotypes as well so one female may differ from the other in terms of her symptoms she may not express all of them at the same time she may express some of them so there are differences Treatment is dependent on what type of symptoms the, the patient is actually having. So some females will be given biguanides to improve that insulin sensitivity, get your insulin levels down, try and improve um, uh, all of the negative effects that come from uh, high levels of insulin. Oral contraceptives can try and uh, restore menstrual irregularity. So in females that aren't having regular periods, uh, oral contraceptives could be given. Clomiphene, uh, quite effective in inducing ovulation uh, and statins are used when patients have present with dyslipidemia. Most importantly though, modification of your lifestyle, so exercise and diet, is the first line uh, treatment for PCOS. Okay? And exercise is extremely beneficial as shown by several research studies. So in this systematic review, which is a very comprehensive way of looking at the literature, uh, it was shown that exercise, just 12 weeks of moderate intensity exercise, was enough to improve several of the cardiovascular disease risk factors, for example, insulin resistance, high blood pressure, dyslipidemia, and that visceral fat. So 12 weeks was enough to improve those and there was an increase in ovulation rates as well uh, and the response to any females that were receiving IVF treatment in vitro fertilization was also better. So exercise was able to enhance reproductive health and also control for the risk factors that, that might affect reproductive health. Similarly, we have another study here is looking at exercise on insulin resistance and body composition. Again, the findings are similar. So the summary of those two comprehensive ways of looking at the scientific uh, research uh, suggests that exercise is good for reproductive health. 
So in terms of the benefits of exercise then, um, it has three main benefits. So it improves directly the reproductive function. So what's actually happening in, in the ovaries, the hormones as well. Uh, and in fact, women who exercise regularly have increased ovulation rates, better responsiveness to IVF treatment, as we've mentioned. But the pregnancy rate in PCS women who exercise regularly, so we're talking aerobic exercise, uh, is around about 35%. So the pregnancy rate does start to go uh, up once you start to control exercise and also dietary factors that can lead to obesity and worsening cholesterol levels. Your cardiovascular risk reduces as well by controlling those risk factors uh, and it has a very good effect exercise on mental health and this shouldn't be underestimated because females that have PCOS they're young some of them might be trying for quite a while to, to get pregnant and it can really affect um, uh, their mental state of mind and exercise has been shown to improve um, or reduce depressive symptoms improve mood uh, and obviously body image and, and that can and subsequently lead to improved quality of life Okay, so in terms of reproductive function, uh, as I've alluded to already, exercise will improve insulin sensitivity. So whenever we eat a meal, we have an in insulin is released to try and get the glucose out of the blood and be stored in the muscle, in the liver. Uh, now in people that are insulin resistant, the insulin uh, is released, but the body doesn't res respond to it or the cells don't respond to it. So you have increased amounts of glucose circulating in the blood and that can lead to uh, attack on the blood vessels and, and all, all manner of other problems. So insulin sensitivity is increased. That will increase the uh, SHBG levels and that will hopefully reduce uh, the, the hyper those uh, basically elevated androgens. So it will reduce hyperandrogenism, those male uh, sex hormones that are released that affect the ovaries. It will hopefully restore the luteinizing hormone to follicle stimulating hormone ratio as well to uh, near the correct levels uh, and that will allow the dominant, dominant follicles to actually go through their phases and mature and therefore increase the risk of uh, sorry the rate of uh, uh, pregnancy exercise and cardiovascular function so really in a nutshell there will be improvements in the heart and the way that the heart can pump blood to the rest of the body there'll be more blood vessel supply and growth to the muscles as well so you get better circulation a reduction in adipocytes as well so you have a reduction in fat especially around the visceral area where all the organs are as well uh, and growth of mitochondria which in the muscles in the heart as well so that will enable you to have by having better cardiovascular function you have better blood flow and that starts to have better metabolic effects as well so particularly reducing those risk factors as well so uh, exercise also has an anti-inflammatory effect releases various um, different uh, proteins that can have an impact positively on um, uh, uh, general health okay so the evidence is there and the evidence is also there again that in those females that are taking part in regular exercise, exercise and diet alone can induce weight loss and it can improve body image. Um, if you have a lower BMI, you also reduce your risk of having uh, conditions like obstructive sleep apnea, which can increase, um, uh, or in basically obstructive sleep apnea will prevent you from having good quality sleep. Uh, and it's very common actually in females that have PCOS as well. So by having a lower BMI, because obesity is a risk factor for uh, obstructive sleep apnea, you're reducing your risk of having sleep apnea, uh, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, and also you're then improving your sleep quality lower inflammation in the brain that will reduce depressive symptoms uh, improve self-esteem and obviously the reduced hyperandrogenism as well has been shown to improve uh, um, uh, because if the clinical symptoms improve it has been shown to improve uh, or lower mental stress as well so in terms of what one needs to do it's really simple the exercise recommendations for polycystic ovary syndrome are the same what we would recommend for other healthy adults. So 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise per week to include all types of activities like walking, jogging, running, dancing, swimming, cycling, anything that gets your heart rate up, gets you sweating is going to be beneficial. If some of these activities are difficult, then evidence, the scientific evidence has shown brisk walking for about 20 to 30 minutes per day 
is just as effective in improving PCOS symptoms. Try to aim for three to five aerobic sessions per week, 30 to 60 minutes. If you're struggling with maintaining exercise for 30 minutes to begin with, start off with intermittent bouts. So you might do a 10, 15 minute bout, have a break and maybe do another walk or another activity at lunchtime or after work uh, and just try to uh, and break up the exercise if doing one continuous bout is a little bit difficult. Studies have also shown in PCOS high intensity training, so this is very intense training for a short amount of time, is beneficial in PCOS and you could utilise that as an alternative to some of these aerobic activities as well. Um, and of course it's very important to try and increase muscle mass as well because it will improve metabolic health, reduce um, insulin sensitivity, uh, or sorry, improve insulin sensitivity, uh, and it will also basically uh, 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 reduce fat mass and whatnot as well. So resistance training is extremely important. It also in females improves bone health as well, and that's quite important because as females get older, they lose the protective effects of estrogen for bone health. So as they get into older age, they're at a, at a greater risk of developing uh, conditions like osteoporosis. So doing any form of resistance training when you're young helps to increase your bone mineral density reserves, meaning that as you get older, uh, you'll continue to have stronger bones and they won't become weak and brittle. So with resistance training, using you know, two to three days using all types of uh, equipment, machines, free weights, therabands, body weight exercises, uh, and try to focus on all of the muscle groups of the body as well, and do a little bit of flexibility to finish off. So it's really uh, not very difficult to incorporate this is a, a plan on one slide, literally, um, and I think it's, uh, it's about making the starting point. So getting into a regular routine with exercise, controlling the diet, try to aim for something like the Mediterranean diet, uh, and hopefully doing those two things combined will lead to, in around about three months, improvements in PCOS symptoms, and of course for uh, longer term improvements in terms of your metabolic health and cholesterol levels, you might need about five to six months, but nevertheless, as soon as you start the exercise routine, you will start to see uh, multiple improvements uh, and quite quickly as well. So there you have it guys, a brief overview of the importance of exercise as a management tool for uh, polycystic ovary syndrome. I've hope, I hope you've enjoyed the video and I hope to see you again very soon.